Welcome back to Pitch and Benefit Design and Funding Task Force. Um, we are embarking on our final agenda item of the day, um, which is a couple of documents that uh, Chris Roof from the Joint Fiscal Office has prepared for us to um, to help us understand, uh, you know, where where the different levers are that might change the um, unfunded liability trajectory um, on the benefit side. Uh, we've talked a little bit about putting in one-time money. We've talked a little bit about uh, different uh, concepts of revenue that uh, that folks wanted to get more information on. And, uh, and so this afternoon, I'd like us to have an a opportunity to talk a little bit about what some of those changes are. And we had heard uh, expressed um, last at our last meeting that we should have nothing that's off the table um and so i i in keeping with that spirit also responsive to what we talked about earlier today um, i'm hoping that we'll have a chance to uh to go through and talk about some of the potential um levers and instead of saying something's off the table maybe we say that would be on the bottom of my list <laughs> as a last resort um, and see if we can, uh, if we have some time for, for discussion uh, to figure out what uh, what we can conceive of moving forward and doing a little more exploration. With. So Chris, thank you for being with us this afternoon. Thank you. Uh, for the record, Chris Rupp, Joint Fiscal Office. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm gonna start with this document here titled Pensions Potential Options. And I wanna underline and put in bold the word potential. Uh, you know, my role here in JFO is not to advocate for one thing or another. My role is to make sure I'm explaining to everybody so they understand what it is, how it works, and what sort of the relative impact is from these different options. So some actuarial analysis has occurred in months previous um, to this task force occurring, trying to get an understanding of, you know, of all the different factors that go into calculating pension benefits. If modifications were made to different ones, to different levers, if you will, what's, what does that mean and what is the relative fiscal impact of those changes? So my goal here today is to walk through what some of those options are and what they mean and provide some context. So that's that's it. You know, I, I know there's, there's by no means um, unanimity on whether any of these options should or should not be pursued. But in order to have an informed conversation, we want to make sure everybody's starting with sort of a common understanding of what these different factors are around benefit design and what sort of moves the needle, if you will, more than others. So let's, I apologize that I made the rookie mistake in my haste to get these done of not putting slide numbers on my pages. So hopefully I can go through this and none of us get lost, but feel free to jump with any questions or, or tell me if I'm saying something that just Sounds crazy. Um, second page, strategies to reduce the ADAC pressures and the funded ratio. So just as a refresher for everybody, you know, the unfunded liability is really that gap between the assets and the liabilities between these two lines. I'm not picking on the VSTER system by only putting their chart here. I just wanted to put one in to show an example here of, of what that gap is, because I, I tend to be kind of a visual person and I like to, to visualize it that way. So, you know, whenever that gap between the lines gets bigger, you know, that means you need to pay more in the ADAC in order to close that gap. And in the conventional pension model, the ADAC payments fall on the employer because employee contributions fund the normal cost. And the unfunded liability payment is included in the employer's ADAC. So in order to reduce that unfunded liability, you, you know, you need to take some steps to kind of make these lines move closer together. You can either push the liability curve down a little bit or push the asset line up a little bit when all else is equal. Moving on to the third slide. So let's talk first on strategies to reduce the liabilities. And again, these are things that would have the effect of pushing the steepness of that liability curve down a little bit. So both, yes, sir. Sorry, can I just ask a question? I just want to make sure my understanding is correct. If the ADEC was funded 100%, whatever the payments would be from now until 2038, those two points would meet together in 2038 by the end of the authorization schedule? Theoretically, yes. <laughs> when, when all assumptions are met, yes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But when you get to 100% funded, those lines should be tracking right next to each other. Okay, just want to make sure. Other questions? 
I want to make sure that we pause and go slowly that so that folks can ask for clarifications. Yeah. Great. All right. So let's start off with um, on the liability slide, as I mentioned, you know, both the ADEC and the normal cost can be lowered if changes are made to the plan design that essentially lower the cost of future benefits. And that effect, you know, that has the practical effect of slightly flattening the steepness of that accrued liability line. And when you do that, obviously the gap between the assets and liability shrinks, the unfunded liability shrinks a little bit. So as that unfunded liability gets smaller, so too do the ADAC payments because there's less of a hole to fill and therefore the annual payments go down. As long as the pension system is open to new participants, both those lines will likely have an upward slope because they're going to grow with the normal cost every year. You know, every, the, the normal cost represents an annual growth in the liability, but you should also be funding it. So everything's moving in the same direction at the same uh, pace. But the goal in order to improve the funded ratio over time and get those systems up to 100% funded is to move those two asset and liability lines a little bit closer together. The next slide is just a refresher on some context around sort of the numbers um, that are in the fiscal targets that are set forth in Act 75. So back in January, the treasurer uh, provided some preliminary cost impacts for making a range of changes to plan design that would reduce the liabilities and the ADAC for both systems. And in March, the House also, um, there, there were some other potential uh, changes that were proposed in the House. Both cost savings and revenue enhancements were analyzed. And you know, the one really common theme between both the treasurer's report and, and the numbers that were put forth in the house, which we talked about earlier is holding, uh, you know, exempting anybody who's currently retired from any changes. I think, I think we've clarified at this point that you know, it, it's very difficult to make changes on people who are um, already retired, setting aside the question of whether that's desirable or not. It's just legally, it's very difficult to do. So really your, your potential is to make changes on current actives and to people who have not yet been hired. So one of the charges of the task force is to try to come up with a series of recommendations that would lower the unfunded liabilities at ADEX by 25, 100% of the size of the year over year increase. And again, this chart on the right just kind of translates that bureaucratic language into dollar figures. So how do we do that? Well, the next few slides will show some options that, um, of ways to potentially change plan design. And after I sort of describe what they are, we'll then pivot to the other slide deck to go to some numbers and kind of show some preliminary uh, cost impacts based on the actuarial work that already happened. So next slide, let's start with COLAs. Cost of living adjustments are pegged to the consumer price index. The CPI is a measure that the Federal uh, Department of Labor does um, a very regular basis that basically tracks the price of a basket of consumer goods. And the reason why this is a valuable data set is it helps track uh, price inflation and, and help measure the value of the dollar to the average consumer. So if the price of goods that we all typically buy goes up or down, all of those inputs are factored into the CPI. Every year, um, the, the CPI is it, whenever we do the, the COLA based on our statute, they'll take a look at the CPI over the previous fiscal year. And that will inform what the cost of living adjustment will be for the subsequent calendar year. So we would take a look at what did the CPI do during FY21, so July 1st, 2020 to June 30th, 2021. And that will determine what the, the COLA will be beginning January 1st, 2022. There's a little bit of a lag, but that's, that's the way we do it year after year. So, you know, COLAs up to this point um, have not, uh, have actually been an area of some modest actuarial gain. And it's because we've been really lucky that inflation for most of the last decade has not been as high as the projections thought they would be. Um, that is likely to change this year. Um, the, the actuarial assumption, I believe, is an inflation rate of 0.3%, and it was recently lowered from 25 I think. And uh, the CPI for this uh, for this current for for the fiscal year that just ended is going to be higher than that. Um, you know, I'm sure you've all seen in the news that um, you know as as the economy has kind of sputtered back to life after COVID, there's been a lot of supply chain issues, a lot of sort of labor market sorting that has led to some price increases. You know, 
things are sputtering as we get back to normal. And as a result, you know, the supply and demand curves aren't quite, you know, in sync with where they should be. Um, as we get through these growing pains, you know, it remains to be seen what the long-term trend will be um, for, for the CPI and for inflation in general. But really every economist, this is, this is like one of the top issues they're tracking right now, because as Steve noted in, in his presentation, you know, despite the sort of good news we're seeing, um, we're really in unprecedented times. And a lot of what we're seeing is being juiced up by, you know, a, a very unusual level of federal spending. Um, we don't know what's going to happen as the effect of that tapers off and, and the, the sort of economic fundamentals get a little bit more closer to reality. Um, we're in a really interesting spot right now economically. But, you know, this does, however, produce because of that uncertainty, colas are a pretty significant source of risk to the pension systems because it's hard to know long term how this is going to shake out. So, you know, if you have uh, a 2.2 or 2.3 percent inflation assumption and you're getting three plus percent inflation, you don't or, or CPI, you don't necessarily know how long that's going to last. Um, when those years are going to fall in the amortization schedule. So, this is an area of risk to the plan. A range of options could be implemented to lower these costs and this risk, however. You could remove COLAs for some or all employees upon retirement. Um, and you know, COLAs are not something that every system out there does. Um, there are systems out there that have no COLA. There are some systems that, you know, like ours are kind of an automatic annual COLA. And there are some that, you know, it requires sort of an affirmative act of the legislature or, you know, a vote in order to in order to implement a goal. So the landscape is pretty wide on how pension systems uh, treat this. You know, you could also apply a COLA threshold. So, for example, um, a COLA could apply to the first certain dollar level of your annual retirement benefit. And then amounts above the threshold would not increase with the COLA. So that is a way of, you know, mitigating some COLA risk with some equity in mind. So um, people who have a less generous pension benefit are still getting most of the COLA, but if you had a much higher uh, or more generous pension benefit, only a certain portion of your, of your retirement benefit is adjusted every year. Some systems also take a look at this through what's called a risk sharing lens. And you know, maybe they only apply a COLA when the fund achieves some metric of pension health. So you know, one example could be COLAs are frozen if the pension system goes below 80% funded. And then if it gets above 80% funded, there could be you know, a COLA again. You know, th this could look any different ways. The sort of concept here is that it, it could also happen you know, if, if based on an investment benchmark where, you know, if you exceed your rate of return over some period of time, maybe there's a COLA. If you fall short of your assumed rate of return, maybe the COLAs are frozen. And there's also this sort of shared risk, shared gain idea where, you know, if you're implementing some limits on the COLA when times are bad, you know, it, is there a mechanism in place that when times get better, those limits are relaxed a little bit. So that way employees and members who um, shouldered some of the burden of getting the system back to better health, then get to benefit from, you know, from the fact that the health improved. You know, you can also do things like only applying COLAs once an employee has been retired for a minimum period of time. Does it make sense for COLAs to start, you know, within a year after somebody's retired, or does it make sense to maybe let uh, the COLA apply after three years, five years of retirement? And, you know, some systems out there, instead of just doing an automatic across the board COLA for everybody, are treating COLAs almost like an elective option, where whenever you go in and you're about to retire and you select your survivorship option, um, you know, you'll, you'll agree to a reduced annual benefit in exchange for that survivorship option. There are ways out there and systems out there where, you know, people may agree to take an actuarial reduction on their base benefit in exchange for kind of a guaranteed COLA going forward. So those are just some of the levers out there that other systems have, have approached this. Um, I put over here, just throughout the slide deck, uh, just so everybody's memory is kind of refreshed that I tried to, to distill what the current terms are of these benefits for the different plans. And on the bottom of this slide in the sort of minuscule print, um, I try to interpret in plain English kind of like who's in these groups, just to refresh your memories. Most of this information is also available on the one pagers that the treasurer's office has on their website, which I believe Gail's also posted at the committee website. But I wanna make sure that when we're talking about this stuff that people understand what the lay of the land is right now. Are there any questions on COLAs before I move on? Okay. So, oh, 
Another potential lever out there is taking a look at how average final compensation is calculated. So, you know, from one of the earlier slides, Paul, that, you know, the main components of figuring out how much you're going to get at retirement as your base benefit are what's your average final compensation times your years of service credit times your annual benefit multiplier. So any changes to those, those factors will change the benefit you're likely to get at retirement. Most Vermont members have their average final compensation calculated by averaging their three highest consecutive years of salary. The outliers out there are Visa's Group C, which is law enforcement and public safety. Um, theirs are calculated by using just the highest consecutive. And Group D, the judges, their AFC is not based on any average. It's based on their final salary upon retirement. Another thing you can do is modify the vesting period. So an employee, not every employee out there um, is going to be entitled to a pension benefit the day they start. You need to work a minimum number of time, in, a minimum number of years of service in order to qualify for a benefit. Across all of our plans, the vesting period is five years. Five years is a very common practice um, in governments across, uh, across the country. It's very rare to see a DB vesting period lower than that. There are some plans out there that have vesting periods as high as 10 years. You know, uh, Vermont members, you know, across the board right now, it's five years. But, you know, if you make a change one, to the vesting period in the absence of other changes, you know, it really doesn't move the needle that much in terms of dollar savings. And a lot of this is due to the fact that, um, you know, as we heard from, from HR's presentation, a lot of the turnover we see is really before people reach their vesting period. So um, before they reach the five years. So the vesting period in isolation doesn't move the needle um, in terms of savings the way some of the other levers do. I wanted to ask a question because I had observed when we were, I think when we were hearing a presentation from HR, um, the number of people who turn over either before they're vested or before they've got 10 years in really kind of makes me wonder whether, whether those whether the pension benefit was actually a, a factor in, in, in those people coming to work yeah. for the state or, or to become a teacher. Yeah, no, th that's a really good question. And you know, I, think, I think an important consideration for the task force throughout this work is you know, how do we make Vermont an attractive employer for people of more than one career trajectory? Um, you know, there are some industries out there where um, you know, you're likely to have much more longevity than in others. Um, if you're, you know, I'm venturing to guess here that if you're a public school teacher in Vermont, there's a really good chance you're going to be a public school teacher in Vermont for a relatively long period of time. You might move from school to school, you know, you might change your employer, but like that, that's your profession and you're kind of in the system here. You know, there is a range of people with career horizons in state government. You know, not everybody is on the, um, I'm going to accrue 25 years of service time horizon. Um, whenever you have uh, non-classified employees, for example, people that come and go with administrations, senior staff, you know, it's not uncommon for people to be here for less than five years. So is there, is there a way to create a retirement package that's attractive to people who might have more portable or, you know, career horizons or, or sort of that mindset that may not be as focused on staying with the same employer for their whole career? But maybe they're going to work here for a little bit. Maybe they're going to transition to the private sector. You know, maybe they're going to they're going to bounce around. You know, the workforce is so diverse in, in systems that you know I, I do think it's a fair question whether having a one size fits all benefit is attractive to everybody, or whether more than one option should be made available. You know, it's a question that I think this group will have to wrestle with throughout this process. I want to do a little pushback. Please, I'm please. On you, I, I'm going to push back on your comments there. Because I think that um, the attrition in those first five years could just as likely point to the difficulty of the work, which leads to an opposite conclusion. It leads to the conclusion that we need to um, make the job an attractive one so that we can retain teachers. Uh, it could, you know, could be either, but that's my opinion back off it. I also think there's, there's a subtle distinction between what, what is most effective at recruiting somebody and what's most effective at retaining somebody. Say that again. There's, there's a subtle distinction between what, what is most powerful for recruiting somebody versus retaining somebody. Sir? Chris, um, on the, uh, on the uh, off to the right on the slide, um, could you 
define what is anything other than service action performed with regard to these groups C1 and C2. And what I'm trying to understand here is how many of these groups um, have the ability to roll unused uh, annual leave or unused sick time that doesn't, doesn't talk about unused sick time into their final year of salary to plus up the salary that they're just plus up. So yeah, un unused leave time would be sort of the an example that I think of as sort of what would be excluded when you say excluding um, uh, time for, for services other than actually performed. I believe Group C, um, there's an allowance for um, a certain percentage of unused leave time to be counted in the AFC calculation. What, and, about, what about sick time? Sick time? I don't believe so. But I would have to double check the statute. Uh, going back to the question about the importance of benefits um, to people at the state level and, and education. I would say definitely, you know, it's my thought that the longer you're in education, the greater um, that importance of the pension and the benefits that are there. You know, if you have 17, 18 years left to go, the pension is really critical. You know, as a 21 year old, um, you're still learning a lot about the world. So you're hearing about the pensions, so your comprehension maybe isn't there, but pensions for, retention are huge, I feel, um, you know, it really puts people in a difficult place between choosing a, to stay in a profession they love um, versus recognizing, you know what, I can't afford to sacrifice my financial stability um, later on in life as my benefits get cut. So I, I would say that pension benefits are huge, um, especially with retention. Any questions on this slide before we move on? So another potential option, another tool in the toolbox, if you will, is making changes to the normal retirement eligibility. And just as a refresher, uh, you know, normal retirement, I'm throwing that around to mean, you know, retire with unreduced, actuarial, no unreduced benefits. You know, it's, it's your full pension, um, full retirement. You know, in order to qualify under our systems, you need to reach a minimum age or a combination of age and years of service, whichever comes first. So Vermont has a rule of 87 for some VSERS members and a rule of 90 for some teacher members. And the, the effect of those rules is that an employee with 30 plus years of service can retire earlier than age 57 in the state system or earlier than age 60 in the teacher system. Some pension plans nationwide though, require all actives to reach a minimum age with no rule. Uh, you know, the rule really does advantage employees who began their service earlier in their careers but can result in higher pension and OPEC costs. Just because if you, if you retire at an earlier age and you have more time in retirement, you know, there's, that's, that's more benefits that, are, that you're gonna be paid. Um, so, so there's a range out there of how, how different systems treat this. But um, the, the right now, that's, that's the system we have. Um, there are a couple exceptions. Uh, group C on, on the state employee side, that's the law enforcement and public safety group. They can retire early without penalty or in, in other words, no unreduced benefit at age 50 with 20 years of service with mandatory retirement at age 55. Certain uh, group F correction staff may also retire at 55 with 20 years of service without reduction. And uh, one provision that's out there for both uh, teacher and state employees is that if you have 25 years of service, you have the ability to purchase five additional years of service credit. Do we have the costs on uh, purchasing service credit? It should be cap. I believe it's calculated on an actuarial basis. So you're paying for what the cost, theoretically under the assumptions in place at the time, you're paying for what the cost of those will be in terms of what the normal cost of those extra five years would be. Do you have a number on how many people actually purchase credit? I don't, the treasurer's office might. We have a lot of people that purchase right, service credit. It's pretty common and it can also be like for example i did private school year so i can purchase that you can purchase military service years it's not just the end of your career right and those are pretty common provisions that you find in a lot of big state plans is the ability to purchase some service credit for other public service that you've worked elsewhere if you didn't qualify for a pension benefit there but again it's the onus is on the employee to, to purchase the actuarial value of that time. And like you said, the cost goes up significantly. So, you know, back in 2003, when I left, it was 9,200 a year. It's yep. significantly more now. Yep. And that, that's because the normal cost has grown. And they, and they can't. 
there's less time till I retire to reap the rewards of my life. Um, one thing I, I don't see on here captured, it's not quite modifying the normal retirement eligibility, but I think it fits in this liability driver is incentivizing longer, uh, uh, longer working career. Uh, yeah, I, th I think there's some sweet spots here where you both strengthen the plan and reduce costs. Um, that, um, that's, that is, you know, <laughs> Those are the kind of options I think we should put at the top of the list, you know, saying bottom and top. The ones that kind of hit that sweet spot of both saving money and making a stronger plan. Um, so I don't know if it fits in this. Hold that thought for the next slide. Oh, okay. I tried, I tried to look ahead to see if it was captured. Okay, I will, I will hold. Thanks. All right. I, I just want to make an observation, but if someone else has a question first, go ahead. Um, something that you said a moment ago about how how we assess what it costs to buy years um, made me worry that because we have missed many of our assumptions over the last decade, have we also missed the uh, putting the right price tag on what it costs someone to, to, to buy years? I think that's a very fair question. And, you know, again, the calculations are based on what, what you know and what you assume at the time. Um, and, and what we know and assume has changed. And it's changed in the direction of adding cost um, to the pension system, not reducing those costs. So you might, you might be reasonable in assuming that they have undervalued what, what we asked folks if they were buying I think that's a reasonable assumption. And again, this goes back to um, you know, the, the, the demographic and economic assumptions you have in place go into calculating the normal cost, you know, the, um, the amount that a year's worth of pension benefits are gonna, are gonna cost. You know, what do you need to set aside every year to make sure those benefits are fully funded? So you know, if, when your actuarial math is based on sort of what, what is the price of a year of, of future retirement benefits and then the price that goes up because your assumptions changed then yeah i mean we we the price would have it had, had somebody bought five years of service credit today they're likely paying significantly more than if they did that 10 years ago and just to close the loop on this pondering who makes the determination of what the cost to buy years Yes. I think the actuary is under working with the treasurer. Yeah. Hmm? The actuary comes up with factors that are applied in each given situation. And each time their assumption changes, we change, they come up with new, new purchase factors also that's different in each decision. So um, and are they based on the demographic and experience assumptions that were approved by the board? Or the most recent valuation, yes. Yeah. Okay, so it's the treasurer's office in in conversations with the actuary informed by the decisions of the retirement system boards. Right. Okay. So the actuary comes up with the factors that are used in the calculations to come up with the cost of the individual for situation that's completely different based on how many years of service that they have, what their current salary is, and what the projected AFC is going to be based on the current salary. Um, there's multiple factors that get calculated. Thank you. All right. Any other questions for the next slide? All right. So another option or tool in the toolbox is, you know, taking a look at modifying the benefit calculation itself. You know, as I mentioned, your, your base retirement benefit is based on multiplying your years of service and your average final compensation by a service credit multiplier. Our systems here also set forth a maximum benefit level as a percentage of AFC. What, you know, the col colas are on top of that. That's a post-retirement adjustment. So this, is, this dictates your base benefit. Both the service credit multiplier and the AFC cap, and this goes to, to Eric's point, can be adjusted to encourage desired behavior. There's potential to do that. So for example, um, increasing the maximum AFC cap may encourage employees to work longer than they otherwise would, 
which in turn may lower your pension and OPEP costs. Same with you know, adjusting the service credit multiplier upward or downward will adjust the relative generosity of the retirement benefit when all else is equal. But you really need to do some actuarial analysis to make sure you have a good understanding of what the savings would be. Because for every additional year somebody works, they may also be earning a higher salary. So that could adjust their AFC upward. And, and you, know, you might save on one side, but the cost kind of increases on the other. Over here on the right in this table, I wanted to show you what all the benefit multipliers and caps are and kind of translate this into like, what does this really mean? So a uh, group C member, um, a law enforcement public safety member hits their cap after 20 years of service. So 20 times two and a half percent equals you're going to be entitled to 50% of, of your AFC. So any additional year you work beyond the 20 years of service, you know, your, your benefit will go up based on your salary history going up. It's not going to go up necessarily based on the fact that you worked an extra year. So you can see what that looks like for all the other groups here too. And, you know, in the VSERS new group F, um, you know, there's 60% of AFC cap and a 1.67% multiplier. So you roughly hit your cap after 30 years of service. The, I, th hey, I think- Chris, can I just mm -hmm. put a point on that? And I think Harold mentioned this when, when Department of Human Resources spoke, but you hit your cap and then and the next year you still pay your pension vacation out of your paycheck. Yes. You're spending money in, but you're not getting any additional benefit except your potential salary. Yeah, you're, you're not accruing additional service credits. Right. You are you're accruing additional salary growth, most likely. Um, though obviously everybody's employment situation is different. You know that's not necessarily the case, um, depending on where you are. But that's that's correct. And you yes. are getting paid. I mean, if you would rather have your full salary than a fifty percent. Correct. You know, but yeah, right. Right. And, and you know, one lever that. that could be used to, to sort of get to Eric's point is, you know, if, if you want to encourage somebody to work beyond, you know, just for example, the 36 years in, in new group F, you know, there are possibilities to say, you know, for every year worked beyond 36, your AFC cap could increase by some percentage. You're unlikely to see real savings though, if that increase by some percentage is not less than right. your service credit multiplier. Mm -hmm. So, and you could also you could also say you know you don't have to contribute anymore once you hit that cap you no longer need to contribute to the, to the pension fund anymore that you're is. delaying that person pulling on the pension but you're not disincentivizing them from yeah there, there could be a, and I, I think what what hr was referring to is you know there, there could be a possibility of kind of freezing somebody's benefit at right. some level at the same time you're freezing their contributions and then they could continue to work and not, right. not pay the right. contributions but you're also not you know your, your benefit's going to be what it was before before that occurred, so that, that is that's a possibility that could be costed out. Well, there was also the savings in the OPEP for that, right? Which right. Could be significant. That's what it seemed to me that was more where more of the significance. I think I think it's both. Yeah. What's interesting is there's seems like there's multiple ways to do this. Um, my first thought was something like you mentioned, Chris. I hadn't thought of what Harold proposed, which was to stop. The contributions, but there could be something like that where you kind of phase out the contributions uh, rather than stopping it, you know, 0.65% year one, you know, you, you pay one half percent less until it goes to zero. So it's con continue incentivizing that behavior. Um, but just it's, it's interesting, it'll be interesting to discuss the options that, that, that are available. Yeah, and I think it's also worth thinking about, you know, what. If this is the direction you want to go, what what amount is sufficient to be a true incentive to change behavior? You know, is is one percent savings right. in your pay likely going to be sufficient to really change your retirement plans, or or does does the lever need to be a little bit larger? Okay. Any other questions on that slide? All right. So we talked about liabilities, and again, these are just some of the options. Uh, when you when you take a look at all the factors that go into calculating what the benefits are going to be now, these prior slides really focused on taking a look at each one of those little levers and seeing how they work and what effect different changes would have. Now let's take a look at the other line, the asset line on the graph. Here are some things that you can do to boost the assets to try to make those come a little closer together. So obviously a constant focus on your investment managers and investment policies is kind of a no brainer. You know, you wanna make sure that you're being as efficient as you can managing the money at minimal expense and at minimal 
risk and volatility. You know, that's what VPIC's job is, is to really make sure that, you know, the money is being invested prudently and, and, and you know, in accordance with fiduciary duties. And, you know, it, it's always important and it should be a given everywhere that, that it should always be top of mind to try to make sure you're maximizing your investment opportunities. And I, you know, I think you've heard some testimony from the chair of EPIC about some of the steps they've taken in recent years to move to more, for example, um, passive managers out of active managers, which tend to be more expensive and don't necessarily overperform for the price premium you're getting. So those are types, the types of strategies that VPIC has followed. And a lot of other uh, systems out there have moved to in recent years. You should always keep your eye on that ball. That's a no brainer. I mean, that's, that's you know, it, it's obvious. And, you know, it's one of those things, one of the most frequent questions I get when talking about pensions is my portfolio did X percent last year. How come the pension fund did? not And, you know, I, I just I want to take this opportunity just to remind everybody that we invest differently than the pension system does. Um, most of us around this table likely have a greater appetite for risk and volatility than the pension system does, especially if you're like me and you're 34. And a really long time horizon to ride it out and ride the highs and the lows of the market. You know, the pension systems, especially a more mature system like ours, that's paying out more and more in benefits every year, they need to also protect their principal. You know, the, the systems cannot afford to lose 10% or 15% of their assets in a market downturn. You know, that, that is a huge issue. So, you know, a lot of what VPIC does working with their investment consultant is to try to build a portfolio that really a, it tries to capture the gains in the market while hedging your bets against the downs. So, you know, you have some investments that sort of act as ballast in the tank to try to make sure that the system is stable and balanced, even when the S&P and the Dow are doing crazy things. You know, you want to hedge against inflation and try to make sure that the money you have doesn't diminish its buying power. So there, there are drags on performance that some of us around this table may not have in our own personal portfolio. So that's why it's tricky to sort of compare a large institutional investor like that to your own personal experience. So I, I don't mean to go off on a tangent and I'm by no means like a financial or investment guy. So you're going to want to ask other people about those questions, but I'd be remiss not to point out the fact that, you know, there's just fundamental differences in how the pension systems manage their money versus the way any of us do. Um, you know, an obvious way, though, in addition to just keeping your eye on the ball of, in terms of managing your assets and, and the performance of that money in the market is putting more money into the portfolio. So we heard a little bit about um, investing one-time funds to paying down long-term liabilities. Um, you know, there's been a lot of interest and conversation around additional dedicated revenue sources. Those are all options. Um, and, and, you know, employee contribution rates is another lever. So... And again, this is by no means an exhaustive list. Um, there are certainly going to be revenue things that we haven't thought about yet or discussed yet, but I'm just trying to, to frame out the sort of context through which um, these different ideas and proposals end up translating into moving those lines closer together. So in terms of strategies to increase the assets, you know, I can't stress enough how important it is to fully fund and plan to fully fund the ADAC every year. Um, even though the ADAC changes every year based on reality changing, based on what's happened to the fund. You don't want to be in a position where you can't fund the ADAC or, you know, you didn't plan ahead and realize that an ADAC in the future is going to end up costing more than it is today. You know, you don't want to set yourself behind. It, it's really important to just stay on track and make progress because if you don't, you're going to dig yourself into a hole. You can also best one-time revenues toward paying down the unfunded liabilities. And we mentioned, uh, we discussed this at length the last few meetings. And, you know, my point here is just, you know, every dollar you earn through investment gains is a dollar that you don't need to pay in future ADAX. So, you know, there, there's, there's an obvious efficiency there. Um, dedicating revenue sources to paying down pension liabilities can help relieve budgetary pressures from the ADAC payments, especially if there are new revenue sources that aren't already being spoken for to fund some other priority in the budget. One thing to keep in mind, though, is if, if the conversation pivots to a recurring new funding stream, it's probably worth thinking about a funding policy that specifies how that money should be factored into the actuarial math. You know, should the new funds just be used to pay a portion of the ADAC, that would really maximize the budget relief. Or should the new funds 
to be dedicated above and beyond the ADAC and stacked on top of it. Theoretically, that could accelerate the improvement of the funded ratio and save interest costs over time, but provide less near-term budget relief. I don't profess to have the right or wrong answer to this. This is the kind of thing that the appropriations committees have to wrestle with when they're putting their budgets together. But you know, it's an important consideration that you know, if, if new revenues are dedicated, or, are those revenues going to be to sort of offset the existing ADAC and, and, and reduce the cost that that ADAC poses on all the other revenue streams coming into the state? Or should that be above and beyond? Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that the state can afford the latter approach. But it's it's a consideration of, of how to treat the money that I think needs to be front and center. One thing I want to mention um, is that using borrowed funds in order to close pension or OPEB liabilities is risky and it's not recommended by GFOA. I'm just curious, is there a difference between funding the ADEC greater than 100% and investing one time revenues, or in a given year, is that the same thing? I think the practical effect is it's likely treated the same way in okay. the actuarial math. Okay. Yeah. But that last bullet point, uh, that's referring to the pension, pension obligation bonds. Yes. Right? Questions, observations? Can you remind me, TFOA? Government Financial Officers Association. It's, it's the nationwide organization of number crunchers in, in public sector budgets, you know, and, and state and local governments. Okay, so in addition to the, the sort of one-time or recurring revenue um, option, you know, one thing to, to take a look at is, you know, what, what impact does employee contribution rates have on the system? Right now, employees pay a fixed percentage contribution rate set in statute, regardless of how well the pension fund is doing or how expensive the total normal cost becomes. And again, in our system here, what active members pay out of their paychecks goes toward the normal cost. It does not go toward the unfunded liability. The employer pays the unfunded liability payments. The normal cost, however, has grown substantially over time as the assumptions have changed. Right here are the, um, you know, the, the current contribution rates. Um, but you know, over time, the, the, the contribution rates have not kept pace with the growth in the normal cost. Whenever you take a look at the most recent valuation, um, FY20, and you just look you know, across the system, aggregated across all group plans, um, the, the state employee normal cost in the aggregate covers about 53.6 or so percent of the normal cost, and the teacher contributions contribute about 49%. So overall, members pay about half of the, you know, across in the aggregate, across all groups, um, employee members pay roughly half the cost of their pension benefit. Um, these numbers obviously look different from group to group, and we would need the actuaries to, to break that out for us. But, you know, group B, for example, and group C um, likely have significantly higher normal costs than group F, because it's just that there's a different benefit multiplier and a different sort of inherent generosity in the pension benefit. But you could structure these contribution rates in different ways. You know, we right now we have flat contribution rates that are set in statute. You can also have sort of tiered progressive rates, like our income taxes, where the more you earn, the more you pay. There's a little bit of equity in that feature. You can also have systems out there where they have variable rates instead of just fixed rates. So my, the system I came from in Philadelphia is a variable contribution rate pegged to a percentage of the normal cost. So every year when they recalculate the normal cost, they recalculate how much my contribution is going to be. Um, another thing that, that you can do um, that some systems have done in the context of risk sharing is adding a supplemental surcharge on top of the regular contribution rates and triggering those supplemental charges, you know, based on some overall metric of pension health. So, um, you know, one of the systems in my, in my home state recently moved to a system where they'll take a look at the last, you know, nine years or so of investment performance relative to the assumed rate of return. If it falls below the assumed rate of return by some level, an, a supplemental contribution kicks in. 
And then this is reevaluated on a regular basis. So if all of a sudden, you know, the, the average brings you up above the benchmark, you know, those supplemental contributions might go down. You could also, you know, tie it to uh, achieving a certain funded ratio where, where members may pay an extra few percent until the fund reaches 80% funded or some metric like that. There's, there's just a range of, of options of how employee contributions can be structured. Um, it's important to note, though, that the employee contributions in isolation are not going to lower your total accrued pension liability. The real impact that this has is lowering the ADAC payment, because if employee contributions are higher when all else is equal, they will pay for a greater share of the normal cost that would otherwise fall to the employer to pay through the ADAC. Now, it's relatively easy to get a back of the envelope calculation on, you know, if we if every these contribution rates went up by 1% across the board, what would that roughly translate to? And you can do that by just kind of modeling based on what the overall covered payroll is going to look like. So you can get pretty close by taking a look here on the right that, you know, in, in the FY20 evaluations, the systems were assuming that um, in the current fiscal year, the covered payroll would be just shy of $600 million for, for all covered state employees and just shy of $700 million for all covered teachers. So, you know, a rough back of the envelope calculation is if everybody across the board paid an extra 1%, you know, you'd have roughly $6 million of additional revenue coming into the VSER the system, roughly $7 million coming into the teacher system. And that would obviously increase as payroll increases every year. Um, across all plans right now, the assumptions are payroll would increase by 3.5% a year on the state side, 3% a year on the teacher side. I was just wondering here if um, there's an opportunity to think about the fund policy here, like in new revenue. Uh, and what I'm thinking is if employees paid a greater percentage of the normal cost, um, rather than reducing the amount that the state contributed, uh, a portion of that would go to the directly to the funded liability. You know, so uh, it doesn't change the state's, so it wouldn't have the budgetary impact, but it would have an accrued liability. Yeah, I, I think that that is a potential path forward. Um, but, you know, obviously the, the feasibility of implementing that, you know, I, I think in large part depends on, you know, what, what can we do to manage the budgetary impact? Um, but yes. Just wondering if that was, if that's an option. Thank you. Yes, I, it, was, it kind of happened fast, but I yeah. thought I heard you say something about right now the employee pays roughly half the cost. Can you say that statement again? Sure. So right now, employee contributions cover roughly half of the normal cost in the aggregate across all groups. So um, based on the preliminary contribution requirement calculation and the FY20 evaluations, the total normal cost for all teacher members across all groups is about 11.02%. Um, on the state side, it's about 12.67%. So employee contributions, um, you know, cover, cover just over half on the state side. I think across all plans, they bring in about six point, they were projected to bring in about 6.7 or 6.8% of payroll. And on the state side, it was uh, around 5%. And those numbers are all on, on one slide in the valuation study, and they're recalculated every year. And there's a little element of imprecision on that, too, because you're kind of taking what's happened in, in one fiscal year and projecting it based on what you think the payroll is going to be at the end of, you know, two fiscal years in the future. Thank you. Hey, Chris, there's uh, two questions. One, do you know how um, common a progressive, you know, rating or progressive contribution amount is across the country? And in the situation you've described, the variable rates, like how... Like what was the variability that you experienced just for your, from your own experience? Sure. So, um, you know, a progressive tiered structure, you know, in, in my review of, of sort of what, what the landscape looks like, historically is not a dominant um, system. I think some systems have started to embrace it a little more, though. Um, in, in recent years, systems have made changes to their plan design. Um, you know, one system, the, the system I'm familiar with and that we recently did in Philadelphia is, um, based on your income, you would pay a surcharge that went as high as um, two and a half percent, I believe it is. So, so people who earned above one hundred thousand dollars were paying an extra 
two and a half percent above and beyond their base contribution. And I think people under like 35,000 paid nothing or, or, or a pretty nominal amount. And, and, it, and these tiers were sort of structured on sort of the bell curve of the salary distribution. So, you know, they, they made it so the people who are sort of at the, the bottom quartile weren't shouldering the load to the extent that people in the top quartile were. Um, you know, with respect to, to your other question, um, I would have to go back and look what the, the range of supplemental uh, surcharges are and, and or fluctuation in some of the other systems. It's low single digits percentages. Um, you know, and a lot of these systems, when you put something in like this, um, you put guardrails in about how big or how small those those fluctuations can be from year to year. Because you know, I, I think I think there's a, a very compelling public policy argument, um, notwithstanding a political argument, that it's probably not desirable to have people's paychecks fluctuating wildly right. from year to year. So putting some, just based on the performance of the pension fund or, or something else. So a lot of the systems I've seen have put some guardrails in where, you know, contributions may not be able to go up by like one or 2%. And then this is revisited, you know, every year, every two years, every three years. So there's a reasonable range of just how high or low these costs can fluctuate from year to year. What's the regarding the regarding beamers and what are their their contribution rates? Are they also fixed in statute, or are they changed every year, or is it based upon funding formula as far as contributions for following year? That that's a great I've question. A I, I've heard it. That's my question. That's a great question. I may have to phone a friend on this one. <laughs> They are set the statute and a, a couple of years ago, I can't remember what year it was, there was uh, some incremental increases that were, that were uh, adopted, whereby the employee, the employer, employer and employee yeah. contribution rates went up by, I can't remember the numbers, but like an eighth of percent or a quarter percent or something like that. They went out like four or five years or for each year and went up. Um, but uh, they are set like that. But they were changed recently. Yeah, I think it was like, Three years ago, that I can I'll look it up and provide the information. When was the last time they changed any of the other numbers? Uh, it's it's been a little while. I think about ten years ago or so, the teacher um, contribution rate was changed. Um, but I would have to to pull that. I, we, actually, I think um, Gail has a sheet on that. If not, I can provide. Yeah. We have a historical um, spreadsheet on yeah. the um, contribution rates for each groups. Each plan back to the 70s or something like that. Thanks. And one of the other just sort of possibilities in this sort of space is, you know, di different plans have different levels of generosity it's based on what group you're in. Um, group D has more favorable terms than Group F, for example, yet they pay the same contribution rate. Um, one, one path forward could be, you know, does it make sense for, um, each group to pay some some contribution that is a little bit more proportionate to the true normal cost of that group's benefits. Um, so, you know, if a, if a more generous benefit is being offered, um, higher levels of contributions are being collected um, to pay for that more generous benefit. Um, and, and, you know, I don't, I don't want to go on a tangent here, but on the, the subject of, you know, maybe creating more than one option um, for, for different groups of employees to choose, one of the things that Pennsylvania recently did was for new hires, they can choose from two different types of hybrid plans. And what you contribute, you know, obviously your benefit is based on what you contribute. So you can either choose to pay a little bit more to be in a more generous plan, or you can choose to pay a little bit less and be in a slightly less generous plan. So people make the decisions that fit their own career trajectories, but it does provide people with not a sort of a one size fits all approach. Concerned about that, that, that second statement that you made about the people who would be choosing to pay a little bit less, that that had to do with long term plans. I would think that there might, they're very likely is that their current situation at home would might require them or necessitate that they pay a little bit less and get a little. The, so, the differential in the overall rate is small. I think it's one percent or less. Um, the real, the real sort of difference is that in one option you're paying a little bit more towards 
defined benefit and a little less to a defined contribution component. And then the other one, you're, you're doing the opposite. You're paying a little bit more toward your defined contribution component and a little less to the DB. So therefore the DB benefit is calculated on a lower multiplier. But overall, the contribution rate is, it's, it's, it's within one percentage, depending on the plans, how it's split is different. All right, so I, I sort of touched on this throughout, but this sort of concept of risk sharing, um, I, I wanted to dedicate a slide to, um, because this is something that, that has become a, a prevailing trend in a lot of systems that have made changes to their benefit structures in the last decade or so. So, you know, in the, I think you've heard this sort of ad nauseum at this point. In the traditional DB model, the employer bears the risk of addressing underperformance of the pension fund. The employee doesn't bear any risk of higher than expected costs or lower than expected account balances at retirement. So a lot of states to help address the costs, uh, the growing costs of their, their legacy systems and try to mitigate their risk going forward um, from missing actuarial assumptions in the future, have adopted some strategies to sort of share their risk a little bit more with the, with the members of the plans. And if you have a digital copy of this, I added a link here to an ASRA report on this, which gives a pretty comprehensive and, and very readable overview of some of the some examples of the strategies that other states have followed in this sort of vein of risk sharing. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time going into it today, but it is a really good read if you have 20 minutes or so to browse through it. So some of the most common and prevalent forms of sort of risk sharing are, as I mentioned, tying employee contribution rates to the performance of the pension system. So, you know, it could be tied to the, some relation to the normal costs. So when your assumptions change and your normal cost goes up, you know, you, you maintain some consistent percentage of the cost of your future benefits um, and, and things grow sort of in line with one another. Another one is, you know, this example of contribution rates might increase if the fund misses some actuarial benchmark um, and then decrease when the fund exceeds the benchmark. Um, you can also tie certain benefit provisions to the performance of the pension system. So maybe COLAs could be tied to the overall performance of the fund. You know, if you miss your assumptions, um, maybe there's a freeze on a COLA that year. If you exceed your assumptions, maybe, maybe the COLA resumes. Um, and there's these two models of, of plans out there that are being uh, offered in some states to, to new employees called hybrids or cash balance plans. And I have one slide on each that just kind of provides a high level overview of what those are. Hybrid plans are, are a trend that is being increasingly adopted by a lot of states in the aftermath of the Great Recession, and they incorporate features of both DB and DC plans. So the members typically participate in both systems, and, and there's really two kind of models out there. There's this the sort of side-by-side -side model and the stacked hybrid model. Um, a lot of times in the side-by-side -side model, you'll participate in a DB plan that might look a little bit different from the legacy plans. So maybe there's a little bit less of a contribution rate. Maybe there's a different retirement age, maybe a lower benefit multiplier. Um, but the key sort of theme is there's still a defined benefit component and newly hired members are still participating in the pension system. You know, it, it would sort of be a creating a new group, you know, a group G or a group H um, where, where new folks would come in, they'd still make contributions into the system, they'd be paying for their normal cost, um, their, their funds would be invested in VPIC with everything else, they would just accrue a benefit at a different rate than the legacy plans. But in addition to that, um, there's a DC, a defined contribution plan offered with an employer match. Um, so I provided an example here from my home state where, you know, there are, there's, there's two systems where, um, you know, you, you participate in both a DB and a DC. Um, the one, you know, you contribute 5% to the DB and your service credit multiplier is 1.25%. So that's less generous than the legacy plan, which is high as like 2.5%, which is why the system is really struggling to do what it needs to do right now. Um, you know, they also have next to that a DC component where um, members would pay in and then the employer, um, would match that as well with um, two and a quarter percent. So that way, members not only have some defined benefit at retirement, but they also have an alternative savings vehicle that has some portability. Where you know maybe if they're not going to be there for thirty years, they can they can move to the next job and still have some money accumulated with an employer match in a retirement account that's portable, and they can move to the next job. There's also that's the more prevalent form of hybrid. Um, you know, 
There's another one called the stacked hybrid and Philadelphia is really the, the most prominent example of this um, that, that at least I've found or, or that I've, cite, I've seen cited in, in literature. That it works a little different. Instead of everybody having sort of two sides of the same coin and you participate in both, it, it's the way the stacked hybrid works is the DB is available to everybody up to a certain income level. And then the DC plan is available to people who earn above that. So that line, that income line in Philadelphia was set at $65,000. And that was a level that was relatively close to the median salary of our average payroll. What that plan means is if I earn $65,000, my benefit looks the same as under the legacy plan or pretty close to it. Um, you know, the multiplier is the same, the contribution rate is similar. I think we adjusted the vesting period to 10 years, but generally people who are, who are there didn't didn't lose a whole lot from where they were previously with respect to the changes to the DB. But if I earn more than $65,000, I would still participate in that plan, but I, I would stop paying contributions after $65,000 of income. And my AFC for defined benefit calculation purposes is also capped at that 65. But for every dollar I earn above 65, I put money into a DC plan that is matched by employer contributions. So the higher earners not only have sort of a base defined benefit that provides reasonable level of retirement security, um, but they also have sort of that alternative savings vehicle available to them on top of it. The real advantages to the stacked hybrid that we found were A, it helps limit your future liability from paying really unusually high defined benefit benefits. It, it was not uncommon to have people who would, at the end of their careers, you know, you may start at the bottom rung, and, and after 40 years, you leave as a commissioner or a deputy commissioner with a very generous salary, and you've accrued so many service credits that you're retiring with a very good six-figure pension, um, which is something that, you know, certainly drains money out of the system and is not an experience that re is representative of the vast majority of the workforce. So one of the advantages of, of setting that cap was you limit some of the future exposure to paying overly, you know, relatively overly generous benefits. But you also provide an alternative savings vehicle available to people who we had a lot of higher earners who didn't have the 30 year career prize. And, you know, some did and they worked their way up. Some come and go with, with, with mayoral administrations. So, you know, this allowed people who may not be there for 10 years to be able to save something while they're there and move on to the next job and still have a little bit of a nest egg built up that's portable. The real advantage of the DC is it adds that element of portability because you can roll those contributions over into IRAs and take them with you when you go from system to system. Are there any questions on this slide? Of course, on that one, the most someone's AFC could possibly be a 65,000. Correct. And so for, as far as the pension is concerned, like every person that's involved in a pension earns 65,000 or less, like that's the... That, that's the way it works. And the, the, the exceptions to this were we did not include public safety or law enforcement and elected officials chose not to include themselves. Um, but otherwise, all, all sort of rank and file city workers who are hired um, for future hires, um, the pension system treats them as if their IFC can't go above 65. Right. Okay. One of the other forms of sort of risk sharing out there are models out there, the alternative to DV models. This one's less prevalent, but it is prevalent in some states. It's called a cash balance plan. Uh, you know, these are not as widely adopted, but they do offer sort of the, the same idea of a defined benefit. But when you take a look at your normal pension um, system, you know, your typical model, your benefit is dictated a lot by your final terminal earnings, your average final compensation, your three years at the end, which tend to be your three highest years. Um, in a cash balance plan, the, the, the benefit you get at retirement is based a little bit more on your career average of earnings. So if you're in a cash balance plan, every year you work, the employer puts a credit as a percentage of pay into your hypothetical account. You know, it's not like a decent, it's not a defined contribution where you've got dollars sitting in the bank mm -hmm. invested in some Vanguard fund. This is a hypothetical account where you accrue credits. So every year the employer will give you credits as a percentage of pay and a defined interest credit. So these accrue over time in the account, the account centrally managed, and the employer funds these accounts on an actuarial basis like they do with DBs. The investment risk though remains with the employer. So if your money didn't grow at the rate that the 
interest credits were growing in somebody's account, the employer needs to make up for that. But as you work and the longer you work, the balance of credits in your account will start accruing bigger and bigger over time. So how big that balance grows plus your retirement age determines how much money you're gonna get at retirement. This system tends to be a little more portable than a legacy sort of DB plan because whenever you leave before retirement, when you terminate, you have a couple options. You can either leave your balance in the plan and keep getting some interest credits on it. You can convert the balance of credits into an annuity whenever you want, basically. So, you know, within some reason, if, if, if I'm retiring at 67, the calculation is going to look different than if I retired at 62, for example, with, with the same balance. Um, or you can convert the credits into a lump sum and roll it into an IRA. You know, if, if I decide to leave and go somewhere else, I can, I can take the credits I have, exchange them for, for cash on, on, on some actuarial basis and put that into my retirement savings and I'm going to move, I'm going to take with me to the next job. But unlike hybrids, um, you know, in a cash balance plan, you're not maintaining the membership participation in the legacy DB system. You know, when, all these new hires are not going to be making contributions that can go toward sort of solving the problem that's built up. It's sort of creating a whole new walled off system that is outside of, of the current systems that we have in place. So are there any questions on that before we move on? So why would the cash balance essentially get the done so through the IRS and then the employees have been given the cash balance uh, based upon the appropriate formula and they then take it to their IRA or they roll it said that's not actually seen that occur that necessarily in the all time I did is that is that accurate I think so okay. <laughs> it sounds accurate <laughs> The options that they go to are the same with what you're yeah. which you have here. So, yeah, I mean, it wasn't called a cash balance plan because right. that hadn't been done. Right. And, and, you know, I think a key distinction here, sort of between the, the cash balance and your normal sort of legacy plan, is, is you know, the, the sort of the determining factor isn't how long you've worked and what, you, what your final salary was. It was, you know, in addition, you know, how much did you earn throughout your career there? You know, how big your balance grow and and over time how many credits did you accrue in your account and then you know how many years do you reasonably expect to be retired for um those will determine you know what your annuity payout will be okay so we're almost finished with this uh one thing to to keep in mind throughout this conversation around options and levers is you know the universe of impacted members um impacted by any change now, as we mentioned, it's really hard to make changes uh, to people who are already retired. Um, you know, if you make changes that are limited to um, the, the, or if you make changes to the current workforce, that is likely going to generate much larger near-term fiscal impacts. Um, but they are likely going to be more difficult for parties to come to agree with you on, as, as I'm sure we are all suspecting. Um, on the other hand, if you make changes that only apply prospectively to new hires, you know, that might be a little bit easier to come to agreement on. But it's going to take longer to recognize the fiscal impact of those changes because you need employee attrition to happen because it's all based on the new hires coming in who are either paying more or accruing a lower liability. So over time, it becomes more of a more of a net positive to the system. Um, you know, one possible path forward uh, that that we sort of mentioned in the context of thinking through recommendations around the 150 million is. You know, does it make sense to create a new plan for, for new hires and incentivize current hires to maybe switch from the plan and to the new plant? Um, you know, maybe, maybe folks don't have the, the 20 or 30 year career horizon and, and maybe there's an incentive that, that, uh, that could be made attractive to people to switch plans for some period of time to maybe earn uh, a different retirement benefit, but also pay less out of their paycheck for it. It's just an option out there that's worth considering. And one thing that, you know, I'd be remiss to not point out, and, and I think this was a, a common theme throughout this pension conversation has been, you know, changes often have unintended consequences to employee behavior. You, you know, those unintended consequences could adversely impact not only the pension fund, but also on the business side of delivering core services. You know, you don't want to create mass exodus of people retiring um, at once, especially if those folks are already eligible to retire and they're, you know, when all else equal, likely representing an actuarial gain for every extra year they work. Um, so, so it's something to be mindful of is that, you know, whatever changes you make in this context, 
are likely going to have some sort of unintended consequence. You need to understand what those unintended consequences are and do your best to mitigate them. It's just, it's always something to be mindful of. Um, options for future hires, you know, and, and again, this is just sort of trying to structure some thinking that, you know, we can have a conversation about what to do, if anything, for, for people who are currently active employees and paying into the system. But as you start thinking prospectively, um, you know, you have a few options. You could either the status quo, just keep doing what you're doing, or you can create new plans with different benefit and contribution structures for new hires. So that's, that's some of what we were just talking about. You know, you could either stay with the defined benefit model, but maybe with some different terms than the, the sort of old plans or the legacy plans. You could create defined contribution plans with employer matches. You could do hybrid plans that have those features of both the DB and the DC. You know, I, I think it's worth asking questions about to what extent should new hires have the option of choosing which plan. You know, there are there are some systems that it's mandatory to go into a new plan. There are some systems out there where you have the choice. You can either go into this plan or maybe pay more to go into the old plan. So, you know, this sort of idea of incentives versus mandates is something that that is important to be mindful of. And on, in a similar vein, you know, should there be steps taken to encourage people who are already in the system um, to maybe switch to another plan, um, just based on their own personal financial interest and career horizon with, with the employer? Um, these are all questions that are worth thinking through and evaluating in the context of making any changes going forward. You know, a lot of states have made changes prospectively, and, and typically they were created mostly for new hires with the goal of reducing the risk of growing retirement liabilities in the future. So that's been the common theme. It's like, how do we just contain the risk going forward? Um, and, you know, it's, as I mentioned, having more plan options may appeal to different segments of the workforce, just because everybody, especially when you look at how diverse the occupations are, especially in the state system, you know, maybe some folks have higher expectations of career mobility than others. So I think part of sort of the recruitment question that, that we're all wrestling with is, how do we make sure these benefit packages are attractive to every segment of the workforce? Um, one thing I want to stress here is, you know, DC plans have had a lot of conversation in the last decade plus. Moving all new hires to a DC plan will do nothing to address the current structural issues facing the pension plans or the liabilities that have already accrued. Because if you move everybody to a DC plan, you're gonna have people in another system are not contributing um, from the active payroll toward these legacy plans. So there may be compelling reasons to implement a DC option for people, but um, the one thing I wanna make clear is that doing that is not gonna fundamentally solve the math challenge we're all wrestling with. Um, and even though there's been a lot of conversation around DCs and more states have adopted them as sort of options in their menu of, of retirement benefits, very few states or large governments have abandoned the DB model entirely. The DB still remains sort of the gold standard and the most prevalent model of providing retirement security among state and large city governments. The DB model has just looked a little different over time. So if you have any extra time on, uh, in, your, in your ample spare time um, and you wanna read a little bit more on what some other states have done on these issues, I added four links here that go to some materials that NAS together, which are actually very easy to read and, and they're pretty informative about just what some of these strategies have looked like in other states and, and, and what folks across the country have done, especially since the recession when modifying their retirement structures. And it can be a really helpful sort of guidepost to look and see what all has been adopted. And it might be a good homework assignment for all of us to take a peek at these, given that we're gonna have a presentation from NASRA um, in a couple weeks. Um, so Chris, not to second guess this very complete list and my head is really still spinning and I've heard all of these things before. Um, are there any folks around the table who can think of other potential adjustments that should be considered or should be included in this, uh, in this list of options? I don't know if this is other, but I think at one point I uh, put out the idea of potentially giving people the option to pay more in um, for exchange of service credits down the road. Uh, I don't know exactly where that fits in here, um, but thinking that if people pay in a, a higher percent of money in their career, that that could translate to being able to retire earlier. 
more money in the system up front is helpful. I think that that's something that would have to be costed out by yeah. actuaries. Yeah. Other ideas, Peter. So a lot of Vermonters do not begin to draw retirement for the social security retirement date. So I would like to see what we can say if we went to a full by social security. Uh, that might be a good segue to the second slide. Can I ask a question about that? Sure. Do you mean working until the full? Um, Not necessarily. Or deferring? Defer, you would defer draw until okay. you could retire at age 55, but not uh -huh. draw until full retirement at age for 66. Okay, just for the yeah. yeah. I also wanted to add just, I want to make sure that um, Michael, your thought earlier, which I believe that this was sort of simulated maybe by Harold's presentation, gets in the record too about the incentivizing at the top and um, to continue working. Perhaps not paying into the system if the draw if the numbers aren't increasing. I can imagine as I see the complexity of how these things all fit together that it's it's gonna take us a fair amount of time to even to give a request to the actuaries to ask them to come back and tell us, you know, does this work? Is this helpful and how helpful is it? And so as it, and I think that in just in terms of their palatability, I think some of these that are more of a carrot and a stick woven into one might be better, uh, might be more acceptable to folks who are in the workforce than, uh, than, than some of the things that are a little bit more straightforward, you know, a little bit from list A and a little bit from list B. Um, and so I, I wanna make sure that we um, move as quickly as we can group to start thinking about well I'd like to cost out you know this or yeah. Yeah. so on that note um so I was doing a deep dive and that was one of my precious afternoons Chris um into all the documents you have on your I'm just kidding, on all on the house operations and all of that because you have you guys have gone over this before right a lot of this information but um I saw just in um the treasurer Pierce's report from January that she does a lot of, um, there's already been some actual, actual work on if the contribution was this or if we did, is there a way, and there are different reports with different um, estimates and stuff like that. Is there a way we can just grab all of that from the different reports and just have it, is it what we're going on? I that's think the that's, the, that's that, another good segue. That's a great segue, but I, yeah. um, and, and Chris is, uh, is um, a treasure to have for us to, to because he uh, anticipated that that would be the next set of questions is understanding the extent to which you, you can impact the unfunded liability with these changes. But I also want to make note that it is now eight minutes of four o'clock and I don't think that we're going to cruise through this with any level of understanding in eight minutes. Um, and uh, Michael passed out a, a, a sheet of paper here for us that I guess I would like to suggest that we give Michael a, a moment to explain what this is and that we come back to this at the beginning of next meeting. Is that Okay, because the understanding the relative weights of some of the changes or the impact of some of the changes is really important to informing how we um, how we plan the first plug of asks of the actuary. So, anyway, Commissioner, take it away. <laughs> well, thank you very much. So, um, so I was talking with Sarah, you know, during the break and saying. Um, you know, I think the, the agenda set is very really important to be debating, but what would be probably most helpful for us at this point is that a broader sort of perspective as to where we're heading. Um, I, I think Kate even mentioned this a couple of uh, meetings ago. And, and so how I visualize that or think about that is, okay, so what's the, what's the work product that's upcoming, you know, 
we're sort of skipping ahead of the final report for a minute just to that interim report. So if we need to put out an interim report on October 15th, you know, we have seven meetings between now, seven more meetings between now and October 15th. So what are the things that we need to accomplish in those seven meetings? And again, just going from October 15th forward or backward, I guess, you know, on October 13th, that's the last meeting we have before that interim report is published. So, you know, I think you would spend that meeting pretty much not like going into the weeds, but pretty much saying like, yeah, we're all good with this final report. So much of that work would have to have been done before uh, October 13th. So, so then if we're talking about really going through a draft in really deep detail, I mean, that's probably October 6th, September 22nd. Um, so maybe even September 15th is when we see a first draft of that, of that interim report, um, but some of that time period. So if that is the case, then what do we need to accomplish on September 9th, August, I think it's 25th, not the 26th, and, uh, and then August 18th. So, so I just wanted to put that on the table and we could talk about what happens after the interim report as well. But I think just picking that October 15th date and thinking about what do the next seven meetings look like? Who do we want to hear from? What are the work plans for each of those meetings? And, you know, what do we hope to accomplish so that we can meet that October 15th uh, goal in a way that is thoughtful and constructive? And, and we hear from all the people that we still want to hear from, get all the input that we want to hear. One question that I have is, uh, is whether the request has been made of the actuary um, formally to give us a cross subsidization um, analysis. The answer is no. I think we're still waiting for uh, the request. But if they're aware of what they're looking for, but uh, I think um, the, uh, as I understand, the, the request is going to come from the joint fiscal office. So let's just make sure that all of the folks sitting around the table understand the process, because I know that we've already agreed that we want to have that done mm -hmm. and that that is something that can be done now in advance of us trying to figure out what menu of ideas we want to work on. So for those of us who have not been through this, how, can can you explain the process that we're using in order to make that request? So my understanding from the memo that was sent that the request would come from the joint fiscal office. Was that your understanding as well? Yes. So we just need to send an email. We need to have something from you, the request coming from the joint fiscal office requesting. We've already had conversations with the actuary because they've seen that the, when they understand the topic that we're okay. I sent, it's not that they haven't heard this before. Okay. But it interests in terms of a formal request. Okay. Okay. Do, do task force members want to have a discussion about that right now, or would you defer to us to initiate that analysis of the subsidization between the different groups within the state and local system? I think that's specifically in our charge, so um, it is. I don't know, you know, whether we need to have any discussion. Okay. Just want to make sure there weren't any red flags. Will is uh, not here this week. Uh, you can also send it to you. So, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so working backward from the interim report date, recognizing that we need to we need to figure out what how we're gonna plan out the rest of August and September, understanding that those two meetings at the beginning of October will likely be focused around the first and second drafts of an interim report. Um, we also already have a couple things on for those early meetings, like the 18th period will be kind of like at the second draft, right, of the statement of the principles. And then on the 25th, we're going to have that report. And now we have added um, part two of Chris's presentation um, impacts of various possible changes. Um, we're adding that to the August 18th agenda, which we spoke about 
back way back at nine o'clock this morning, which feels like it was a day ago. Yep. Um, I love the idea of mapping all this stuff, but I wonder if that should take a down the time of the There's specific um, the interim report, but what I guess for me would be what exactly would we want to have in that, and then that would dictate where we need to be on the 15th. It's yep. a very good point. Yep. So we should factor in some agenda time at our next meeting to uh, to to have a discussion about what each of us thinks should be included in that October 15th report. And then the, from there, uh, hopefully we can come to an understanding of the steps that we need to take along the way to get there. We um, we have some witnesses, or not, not witnesses, just some you know, um, speakers who we would like to invite, but there's a list but it's been finalized right now. Can we send that? Will we send that when it's um when we have a more solid plan on who could be possibly speak um, issues? I, I'm not sure what you mean by a list. It's it's a list we came up with of some people um like from oh, um I think it's four names. Is it four names, Andrew? Yeah, there is a couple of thinking about uh, you know trying to get policy. But I think we talked about public assets to come and talk to us. Um, possibly seeing if Dan yeah. Newman could come speak. So, well. just on that one, what is he going to speak on? I mean, because I've looked at their website, they have nothing on pensions. They've published a lot of a lot of work on a broad range of issues, but we haven't been able to find yeah. anything related to that, which is why. I went to we NC first the, to yeah. get. So I'm just wondering. I, I found absolutely no research on pensions on their right. site. So. so there will be an email sent just with who the people are and why. I'm just saying there is a list, and we're just sending it out saying, "Hey, this will be. Let's look at this and see if we can have." I did. I have looked at it. What? I could just maybe build on that. Um, so it sounds like we have uh, net economic benefits uh, potentially. Well, NC Paris hasn't been scheduled yet. So yes, um, but they've gone back to me now. Okay. Um, so that might be on the agenda for August 26. I'm kind of thinking, yeah, yeah sure, correct. <laughs> uh, that as if we chart out what what our big picture work plan is, that uh, we can insert uh, people we want to hear from on those topics. Maybe revisiting this on August 18th. Again, where is a good place to be for today? Last question. I don't know who made this document, but is it possible that whoever made it could turn it into like a um, a document where we actually start mapping out the different things underneath? Maybe maybe as a page, and then we all have access to it. Could it, could it be something that's shared as a Google Doc? Whether we're all editors or not, like the, that might be a fiasco, but it would be great for us to just all be able to kind of look at it and have a common understanding. I, could, I, I just I typed it up just during the meeting, not, so I, but I could put it into a Google Doc and share it with everybody. Okay, um, I think you're absolutely right. Like, I think ultimately that's what you want to do is sort of, and it's not like it's a concrete thing, like it can't be moved, but you know, if there's a certain person we want to hear from, we should know like, well, time's running short, so we should make that on the 9th or the 25th. Or, and you can sort of build that out and see what, you know, what else we have to get done on that day, you know, to meet those deadlines. Yeah, and no, I really appreciate the fact that design. Yeah. <laughs> so is that August 25th for that date? Not the 25th. It's not right. All right. I perpetuated the, uh, the um. <laughs> it's a, a vestige of a previous mistake. So if there are other speakers we need, the sooner we identify them, the easier it will be yep. to get them. So right now, we have Master coming in and uh, it reached out to NC Purse, who's right. done the economic We hope they get the list out this afternoon or not tomorrow. 
to see if you guys can look at it and see what we think of. Well, you're going to provide a list of speakers. Yeah. Good. Okay, so we'll talk about that on the 18th. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Um, I believe that it is past time, and that is all we have time for today. So we will. Um, we will see you all on the 18th. Michael Chernick, thank you so much for being with us today to take notes.